provides an introduction to synchrotron-based micro X-ray fluorescence imaging at SSRL. My name is Sharon Bone. I'm a beamline scientist at these beamlines, along with Sam Webb, who's the lead staff scientist, and Nick Edwards and Jocelyn Richardson. Micro X-ray fluorescence imaging is used to obtain two-dimensional images with micron resolution of many different types of materials, including electrodes, biological tissues, and many different types of environmental samples. At a micro X-ray fluorescence beamline, the sample is mounted on a stage that drives up horizontally and vertically across the path of a focused X-ray beam. This me method of measurement is called raster scanning, where the beam stays fixed in place and the sample is scanned across it in order to generate a two-dimensional image. When the focused X-ray beam hits the sample, it causes the elements in that sample to fluoresce, which is then measured by the energy dispersive detector. Fluorescent X-rays are emitted when the incident X-ray energy is greater than the electron binding energy for an atom. So the X-ray comes in, ejects a core level electron, leaving behind a core hole. This configuration is unstable, so an electron with higher energy falls into that core hole, giving off a fluorescent X-ray. Importantly, that fluorescent X-ray energy is characteristic of the element. So we can measure the intensity of X-rays as a function of their energy using an energy dispersive detector in order to obtain information on the elemental composition of the sample. So X-ray fluorescent imaging generates elemental maps for all elements in the sample simultaneously as long as the elements of interest have absorption energies less than the incident energy of the incoming X-ray beam. So why should you use X-ray fluorescence imaging? X-ray imaging or X-ray microscopy is comparable in many ways to electron microscopy. Both tools can be used to look at elemental mapping. However, there are some key differences which provide uh, pros and cons to each. Electron microscopy can be used to obtain higher spatial resolution on the order of nanometers, whereas X-ray microscopy at SSRL provides spatial resolution between 1 and 100 microns. However, electron microscopy must be performed in a vacuum environment, and it must be performed on conducting samples for SEM or very thin samples for TEM. And finally, it um, must utilize a geometrically constrained sample environment. In contrast, X-ray microscopy can be performed in any atmosphere, thick samples can be measured, and we have a very flexible sample environment. The two most important aspects of X-ray microscopy relative to electron microscopy, however, are first that this technique has very low detection limits on the order of 10 to 100 femtograms per micron squared, and finally, one can obtain chemical speciation in addition to elemental mapping. SSRL has four micro XRF beamlines, 2, 3, 7, 2, 6, 2, and 14, 3. These beamlines vary in their spot size or spatial resolution and field of view, which is the total area that you can scan, as well as their energy range. Beamline 2, 3 has a spot size of 1 or 5 microns and a field of view of 24 by 24 millimeters. The energy range is from 5 to 18 keV. Beamline 7-2 has a comparable energy range to beamline 2-3, but a much coarser spatial resolution, 50 or 100 microns, and a much wider field of view, 300 by 600 millimeters. Beamline 6-2 is comparable to beamline 7-2, except that the energy range is a bit broader we can go down to the sulfur K edge at 2.5 keV, and we can go up to 18 keV to capture the L edge of certain lanthanides, including uranium and plutonium. Finally, beamline 14.3 is the sister beamline to 2.3, sharing the same spot size and field of view, but it operates in the tender X-ray regime between 2 and 5 keV, importantly giving us access to both the phosphorus K edge and the sulfur K edge. So now let's take a look at the different beamline components. This example is from 14.3, although it's illustrative of all of our microimaging beamlines. At 
the x-rays emanate from a bent magnet. They then go on to a collimating mirror and from there to a silicon double crystal monochromator. Beamline 14.3 and all of our beamlines at SSRL offer a 111 double crystal monochromator. However, 6.2 in addition to the 111 also has a 311 monochromator option which provides higher energy resolution. The beam then goes on to a toroidal focusing mirror into the hutch through a couple of different aperturing slits and finally to the focusing optics and onto the sample. The focusing optics determine the spot size on the sample and different optics are available at different microprobe beam lines. All of SSRL microprobe beam lines use reflective optics which are achromatic. That means that we can use the same optic across a very broad energy range uh, spanning uh, thousands of EV. All of our SSRL beamlines used to have KB mirrors or Kirkpatrick Baez mirrors, which are commonly used at micro XRF beamlines around the world. This system utilizes two cylindrical mirrors on orthogonal axes to focus the beam in the vertical and then the horizontal direction, obtaining a spot size as small as five microns. However, we replaced these KB mirrors in 2021 with axialis, axially symmetric mirrors at beamline 14.3 and 2.3. These new optics offer a couple advantages over the original KB optics. First, they provide higher flux, um, an order of magnitude higher for the same spot size. And additionally, we can focus to a smaller spot. So we can now offer a spot size of five microns and a spot size of one micron, and we can easily go in between these two different spot sizes during the course of a measurement. The one disadvantage of these optics is that they have a narrow focal depth, 50 microns for the one micron optic and 150 microns for the five micron optic. This means that your sample needs to be topographically fairly flat in order for the surface to remain in focus um, in the X-ray beam across the area of interest for the measurement. Finally, at beamlines 7.2 and 6.2, we offer capillary optics. Polycapillary focusing optics collect a large solid angle of x-rays from an x-ray source and focus them to a small spot size. Currently, our spot size ranges from 25 to 100 microns. At beamline 7.2, we also offer pinhole collimators, which obtain a lower flux, but do not have a focal depth associated with them. So now that we've seen the beamline um, components, let's talk about what we can actually measure at the microprobe beamlines. We can do micro X-ray fluorescence mapping for quantitative or semi-quantitative elemental analysis. We can do micro X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy or micro zanes on select spots for chemical speciation. Or we can do multi-energy mapping to obtain chemical speciation across a two-dimensional area. In the next set of slides, I'll show you examples of how these have been applied to real samples. However, I'll also note that at beamline 7.2, we can do micro extended X-ray absorption fine structure or XF spectroscopy, which provides additional speciation information on top of micro zanes. And at beamline 6.2, we offer micro high energy resolution fluorescence detection or HERFT zanes spectroscopy which is particularly useful for heavier elements such as mercury, lead, uranium, or plutonium. This is an example of how micro X-ray fluorescence and micro zane spectroscopy can be used to obtain chemical speciation on phosphorus. So phosphorus speciation in soils is vital for understanding phosphorus bioavailability, retention, and transport. In this case, the authors wanted to look at the phosphorus distribution in soils, so they brought thin section samples to beamline 14.3 and mapped out the distribution of phosphorus, aluminum, and silicon. They took these same samples over to 2.3 and collected maps of iron and calcium to compare directly to the phosphorus location. That allowed them to do correlative analysis between the different elements that are present in their soil samples and learn something about the um, environmental location of phosphorus in their soils.
In addition, they selected hot spots of phosphorus and collected microzine spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. These microzanes were collected at the numbered points in the image and are shown um, in the middle plot. So we can see two distinct types of spectra in pink and in blue. The pink spectra are phosphorus in a mineral form and the blue spectra are phosphorus adsorbed to iron oxides. So this study utilized micro XRF and microzanes to identify phosphorus speciation in soil, soil and highlights the potential for this analysis to provide insight into desorption, mineralization, and dissolution processes that govern phosphorus mobility. Importantly, the authors only looked at phosphorus speciation in select points. But what if we want to look at the speciation of phosphorus or another element across the whole two-dimensional area of the sample? In that case, we could utilize multi multiple energy mapping. Multi-energy mapping, as the name indicates, involves collecting the same region of interest on the sample at several, several different energies across the absorption edge of an element of interest. We can then take that stack of maps and obtain from it the chemical form of iron for every pixel in the map. This is done by fitting the intensity of each pixel as a linear combination of the intensities of reference spectra at each of the mapped energies. So this is just like doing a linear combination fit of a six-point Zane spectrum for each single pixel in the map. In this instance, the author was able to obtain the distribution of iron oxide, shown in red, and iron sulfide, shown in blue, and compare that to the distribution of uranium in their sample in order to understand how iron speciation controlled uranium speciation in their uranium-contaminated sediments. As a second example of multiple energy mapping, um, these authors used sulfur multi-energy mapping to examine sulfur speciation in sclerectinian corals. These corals comprise the structural and biological framework of coral reefs. In corals, sulfur is present in both the living tissue and the non-living skeletal component as organic and inorganic species. So, in doing this mapping, they were able to map out the distribution of organics like 16 or glutathione disulfide and compare it to the distribution of inorganic species like sulfonate. So the spatial distribution of these many sulfur species provides insight into coral growth, the response of corals to bleaching events, and even the use of coral, coral skeletons as paleoproxies. As a final example of multi-energy mapping, this technique can be used to look at environmental contamination. So in this example, the authors wanted to examine the mechanism of arsenic sequestration by a plant during phytostabilization of arsenic-bearing mine tailings. So arsenic was released from oxidized pyrite present in the mine tailings and was phytoremediated by two different mechanisms. First, the authors observed the accumulation of arsenic-5 and iron-3 oxide plaques on the root surface of these plants and additionally, they saw reduction of arsenic-5 to arsenic-3 within the interior of the roots. So if you look at the bottom image labeled G, you can see the distribution of arsenic-5 in blue, which is co-located with iron along the epidermis of the root. And then in the interior of the root, you can see the bright green spots, which represent an organic bound arsenic-3 species. So clearly, multi-energy mapping is a very powerful tool for looking at chemical speciation of different types of samples for different problems. However, there are a couple key considerations we need to use in order to successfully collect multi-energy maps. The first is that we need to have large differences in the Zane spectra. So an ideal case is that of arsenic. The Zane spectra for different arsenic oxidation states exhibit white lines that are separated from each other by several EV. A good example is that of iron two and iron three minerals. There's more overlap in these Zane spectra than between the arsenic spectra. However, they do exhibit white lines at distinct energies, and they all also exhibit a pre-edge feature where the intensity of the pre-edge feature varies depending on the iron oxidation state and coordination environment. A hard to impossible example for multi-energy mapping would be um, 
to differentiate between different iron three oxides, so ferrohydrate, hematite, lipidocrosite, and griptite. And you can see that the spectra for all of these oxides, although they do exhibit subtle differences, they exhibit many commonalities. Creage features with approximately the same intensity, white lines with similar intensities, and very similar energies. So this would not be a good problem to use multi-energy mapping for. Uh, finally, um, the last consideration is that one should collect n plus 1 energy maps, where n is the number of different chemical species expected to be present in the sample. So now that we've seen some examples of how micro x-ray fluorescence mapping works, let's discuss some experimental considerations before arriving at beam time. The first is to select the uh, beam line of choice based on the energy regime. So at beam lines 2, 3, and 7, 2, we can access the K edges of many of the transition metals and the L edges of heavier transition metals, the lanthanide series and the actinide series. At beam line 14, 3, we can access the K edges of main group elements, importantly phosphorus and sulfur, the L edges of second row transition metals, and the M edges of third row transition metals and some of the actinides. In addition, one should consider the spatial resolution that is desired, as well as the field of view that one needs uh, for the measurement. And finally, whether one needs multi-energy mapping. And this will determine how long a measurement takes and how many samples one can run at beam time. So for instance, if you were to run a two by two millimeter area with five micron resolution at 50 millisecond dwell time per pixel, you could collect a map in three hours. If you then decided you wanted to map the same area at five different energies in order to get chemical speciation information, this map would then take 15 hours, which is about two shifts of beam time at SSRL. If one wanted to map a larger area instead of two by two millimeters, say 10 by 50 millimeters or one by five centimeters, if one were to try to map this with a spatial resolution of five microns, it would take more than a day. However, if you use a coarser resolution, say 40 microns, you can complete this map in five hours. So in summary, there are several experimental considerations to decide upon before coming to the beamline, including what are the dimensions of your sample? What field of view do you need to examine in order to properly capture sample heterogeneity? Over what length scale do you expect elemental or chemical heterogeneity in your sample? That is, what spatial resolution do you need? One micron, 100 microns. If you're performing multi-energy mapping, how many energies do you need to discriminate between species? And finally, how many samples do you have? So how much time should you allocate to each? And lastly, how much topography do your samples have? If your samples are very coarse with greater than 200 microns of topography, you should be considering using capillary or pinhole optics at 7.2 and 6.2. So lastly, all of this information is summarized on our Beamline webpage, which can be found at samsxrays.com.